Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm your host, Megan. I'm Hannah. And today, I've got something cool for you. I hope so. You may have noticed we've been sprinkling in some smaller episodes. And that's because there are still good stories that need to be told. And we're not just going to throw something out because it's smaller. I agree. So today, I have two insanely super tiny stories, and we're going to mash them into one episode. Sounds good. What, what? Double feature. All right, so our first story is going to be from Delaware, and Jane Marie Pritchard was always an outdoorsy person. She grew up on a 38-acre farm and was really close to her siblings. Her family says she was adventurous, independent, and had a knack for plants. Jane was the valedictorian of her 1976 Poolsville High School class. She was working at Brookside Gardens, which was an upscale botanical garden, and she was pursuing her master's degree in botany at University of Maryland's College Park campus. So she was a smart girl. Yeah, she had it together. Yes. Jane's research often brought her to Blackbird State Forest to focus on a summer vine. It was known as hog peanut or ground bean. (laughs) (laughs) I tried not to laugh. I did. I accidentally saw your reflection in the window. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying not to look at you. (laughs) Backfired. (laughs) Uh, But this plant, it was a native plant with edible seeds, both above and below ground. Badass. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, actually. So for two summers, Jane would drive to the forest and sit in the shade of the tall oak trees and would study. Jane absolutely loved her studies, and she would prepare presentations on her projects and would force her family to watch the slides and see the progress of her bean plant. (laughs) Which I think is so cute. (laughs) She was just so proud of herself. Definitely more drive than I have, because liking to study, mm mm-mm. Not your thing? (laughs) Not here. Um, I will tell you that I feel like I'm studying a lot when I'm putting these stories together. Yeah, I mean, that's valid. Well, Jane put her all into everything that she did. In fact, Jane delivered a speech that described her work to an ecological society of America, and it was a meeting in New York. And she got pretty average teaching reviews from the undergraduates that she was teaching. She was insulted by this. She didn't want to be average. She worked far too hard for that. So, She decided that she was going to get better at it, and she worked so hard, she got the highest teaching reviews of any department's 50 graduate students. Holy shit. When the class filled out the course evaluation, it asked, what are the strong points of the course? And at least 50% wrote Jane Pritchard. That is so awesome. Yes. On September 19th, 1986, Jane drove a blue and white Chevrolet Blazer to a friend's house. Her vehicle was loaded up with her research equipment, and she left early the next morning to head to the forest. Which, I gotta say, I know this was for research, but it never sounds good when you're heading into a forest. I think that's a no-no. I mean, specifically alone. Yeah, maybe that's the part that I'm most freaked out about. Yeah, because, like... I love going into forests, so, like, I love hiking and being in the mountains and forests and whatnot. So, I mean, maybe just not alone. Yes. Jane arrived at the forest around 7 a.m., and she parked along an access road that was just south of Blackbird State Forest Road, and she set up her equipment. Jane was interested in watching the plant leaves turn towards the sun. She was gathering the last portion of data that she needed for her thesis and would finally have her degree in a few months. Jane was taking minute-by-minute recordings of the data, and it ended up abruptly ending right before 10 a.m. 
There was a couple from Perth Amboy, New Jersey, and they were planning a relaxing autumn camping trip in Delaware's Blackbird State Forest. But I feel like it's not going to be relaxing. You don't think so? Nope. I mean, I set it up so it would be. (laughs) Well, they arrived on a Saturday afternoon, and there was a light breeze out. The couple picked a camping spot, set up their tent, and decided to just enjoy an afternoon walk. They had no idea about the nightmare they were in for. As they were walking, they discovered the partially clothed body of Jane Marie Pritchard about 20 feet from the trail. Jane was only 28 years old and had been killed by a shotgun blast to the back. So young. I know. On the Monday after Jane's body was discovered, a man called the police and said he had seen Jane when he was hunting squirrels in the forest the morning that she died. He had seen her talking to another hunter and was able to describe the man to a sketch artist. A composite sketch was released to the press and printed on a flyer. There were many hunters in the forest on the day of Jane's murder, but this was quickly ruled out as an accidental shooting. An autopsy determined that Jane bled to death from shotgun wounds of the uh, left shoulder and neck, and this was homicide. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) We get that. Nearly 300 people were interviewed by the police, and technicians conducted detailed tests of the shotgun pellets that struck Jane. Investigators roped off the area in the forest and examined for days. They used metal detectors and sifted through the soil. They were able to track down the squirrel hunter that said he was seen with, or that was seen with Jane. He was in his late 20s and worked as a janitor at a pharmaceutical company. The police did find some inconsistencies during the interview with this guy. In early October, they charged him with first-degree murder and possession of a deadly weapon during commission of a felony. He ended up being held without bail. Investigators found one piece of evidence at the crime scene, and it was a hair. DNA testing was brand new at this time. And the detective wasn't taking any chances. So Detective James Hendricks flew to California with the tiny hair because there was only one lab that was doing DNA at this time. Can you just imagine flying with your, like, with one, one hair. little piece of hair? Oh my gosh, I, mean, I like, feel like I'd be <laughs> clutching it. Kudos to the dude for being that adamant, but... Seriously, like, I would be, I would be so scared I was going to lose it. Yeah, and I would, because I set everything down. Right. (laughs) Well, this was one of the first cases to use DNA. Scientists found that the hair did not match the suspect. In August 1987, they had to drop the charges and all leads in the case dried up and the case went cold. Well, fuck. I know. The police aren't even sure what the possible motive would even be. In October 2014, Newcastle County Police announced that they were creating a new cold case homicide squad. They're hoping that a fresh look and new technologies may get some of these cases solved. At the time that this was started, this county had between 40 to 50 unsolved homicides that they plan to look at. And this case is at the top of the list, but remains unsolved at this time. Well, damn it. I know. And that's everything I have on this story. Uh, It's actually one of Delaware's most known. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, But there's, it's really interesting because there's just not anything on it. You can't find information. I do got to say, though, like sketch artists, I find them to be the, like some of the most intriguing freaking people in the world because I'm going to tell you what, people can describe things to me and in my head I am seeing it very differently from how they describe it and then once I see it I'm like, oh, that makes more sense. And yeah. I just don't understand how they can sit down and like draw out a person perfectly just by a vague description that someone gives them. That's just crazy to me. Oh, it's a special talent, that's for sure. It like blows my mind. Yeah. That that's even possible. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Sorry, I know that was kind of off topic, but... <laughs> That's okay. Oh, and one thing I was going to mention, too, you know, they keep saying in all the articles that there's no motive, and I get that on the surface there doesn't seem to be, but when I look at it, it's saying that Jane was going to this specific location over and over and over for two summers, and there's a lot of hunters there. Does anybody think that she was being stalked or watched? Maybe a hunter is infatuated with her. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I I don't know. That's the only thing that kind of jumped out at me when I was looking at it. I did not know squirrel hunting was such a thing, but (laughs) it's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) All right. So our next one is most commonly known as Gabby's Bones, the skeleton in the box, or Thermopolis John Doe. I don't think I like any of them. No? None of them sound like a good thing. Okay. Well, when the f- the story first aired on the Unsolved Mystery Show, the person that owned the trunk was referred to as Gabby, and this is a fake name. We now know that the person's name in this story is John Morris, so I'm going to say that, but I know other people keep calling them Gabby. Oh, okay. So, okay. In... 1986, a man named John Morris left several of his possessions with his friend, Newell Sessions. One of the items left behind was an old footlocker, which is like a safe or a trunk, and all of the items were placed in a shed for storage. Six years later, Newell randomly opened the trunk with a torch and discovered human bones inside, which I cannot imagine holding on to a trunk for six years for anybody. I'm just wondering, how the fuck long did he expect him to hold on to it for? I don't know. Like, here, I'm just gonna drop a couple of my possessions off, and then I'm just gonna leave them here for six years. I mean, I would break into it at that point, too. Absolutely. I would not have lasted that long. Maybe six minutes if you leave me with a trunk. I probably... (laughs) Would, like, if it was in a shed and you didn't go in there often, I'd probably just forget about it, to be honest. Sure. And then, yeah, I can see how it could end up that long, because then you just happen to go in there and you're like, huh, that's right! Yeah. Well, now he's got a trunk with bones. Cool. And he's like, I should probably just go ahead and give these bones a proper burial. Now, what? I respect what? that he wanted to give the bones a proper burial. Yeah, but, like, he didn't think... Maybe Mm -mm. we should call the police? No, that is a little confusing, huh? Okay. It wasn't his first thought, but, um, and he didn't even think to, like, call his friend, John Morris, and be like, uh, WTF, man. I, no, see, I would not call them and ask, because then I'd be scared that they're gonna come murder me, because now I know. Oh, for sure. No, I'm just shocked that neither of those options sounded good to him, but whatever. Uh, luckily, his wife was like, um, no, you are going to call the police? Good. Good job, wifey. (laughs) So, Newell thought about it and was like, nah, I'm actually gonna contact John Morris first. So, he calls him up and he's like, hey, opened up that trunk and there's some bones inside. Do you know anything about this? And John Morris is like, um, I had absolutely no idea that there was bones in there. I've never even opened the trunk. Okay, then why would he have it dropped off at his house? Well, he's like, listen, I'm pretty sure that I purchased that trunk at a garage sale. I just can't remember where. So John Morris is like super surprised. Oh my gosh, there's remains in there. Newell contacted Sheriff John Lumley And he was suspicious of John Morris, like, from the jump. Right, because why would you just pick up a fucking trunk from a garage sale? Right, and and never open it? And your friends without opening it? Yeah, it's, like, full, something's rattling around in there, but you're like, eh. Yeah, no. Okay. Not buying it? No. So, he was obviously questioning why John Morris never opened the trunk before. And he said he planned to open the trunk, but didn't have the proper tools. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) The remains were examined and a bullet was discovered in the skull. 
the sheriff met up with John Morris for an interview and he said, yeah, I think I picked up that trunk in Wyoming, Iowa, Illinois, or maybe Oklahoma. That's a really big difference. Yeah. And it may have been in 1973 or sometime after that. Holy shit. (laughs) So, uh, really pinning down the details here. The trunk and the lock were determined to be from the 1930s. Newell was convinced that his friend John Morris was innocent, but the sheriff wasn't so convinced. I'm not either. (laughs) Dude, maybe this is all innocent. Come on. Okay. On March 31st, 1992, the bones were turned over to the Wyoming State Crime Lab and they created a facial reconstruction of the man. They believe the man possibly lost his life sometime after 1908, when the bullet actually became available. The trunk could have been used by someone in the U.S. Armed Services between World War I and World War II. There was a plastic bag inside, and it was for the High V supermarket. It was actually manufactured in the early 1950s. Oh. So we're kind of getting somewhere here. Examination of the bones showed the person was a Caucasian male, aged maybe 50 to 60 years old, and was roughly 5'8 in height. The remains had actually been buried before and were dug back up and placed in the trunk. Oh my god. Yeah. The lower leg bones and one of his hands were missing. And there were several nicks found on the rib cage. The bullet in the head was from a 25 caliber gun. It took more than 24 years to figure out the identity of this victim. Whoa. On October 19th, 2017, a woman from Iowa contacted the sheriff's office and submitted DNA and asked that it be compared to the unidentified man. She believed the skeleton belonged to her grandfather. A DNA comparison concluded that it was a 99.99% match. Yeah. That's crazy. And the skeleton was Joseph Mulvaney, who disappeared from Des Moines, Iowa in 1963. Joseph's death remains a mystery, but here's what we do know about him. He was born on January 3rd, 1921 in Mattoon, Illinois. Joseph joined the Illinois National Guard in 1941 and served during World War II. He worked for the railroad companies in California and met Mary Alice McLeese. The couple had three children and Mary Alice had one child from a previous relationship. This child's name was John David Morris, the person that ended up being in possession what? of Joseph's bones. What? Yeah. Didn't see that coming, did you? I ya? did not. <laughs> in the early 60s, Joseph and Mary Alice took their three children and they moved to Des Moines. The couple bought a house in 1963 and shortly after the paperwork was signed, Joseph disappeared and was never reported missing. Relatives of the victim say that Joseph and Mary Alice didn't have the best relationship and they fought often. Oh, but he got the bones at a garage sale. Yes. In some other fucking state. Exactly. They believe that Joseph was murdered, put in the trunk, and buried in the backyard of their new home. Oh, no. Then John Morris dug him up. And took the trunk with him to Wyoming. Probably after he, like, was done decaying and whatnot, I'm assuming. That could be. Yeah, that's probably when he grabbed him back up, because then he's not going to smell. Yeah. And it's worth mentioning that the investigators had no idea that the man in the trunk was John Morris's stepfather. And he did not offer up the information, because he stuck to his story about getting the trunk from a yard sale. Mm Mm-hmm. John Morris was about 16 years old when Joseph would have gone missing. The police do not believe that John Morris is the one that pulled the trigger, but it's fair to assume that he knows more than he says. Oh, yes. (laughs) I mean, he obviously knew about the bones being buried, so I think there's involvement and also some of his family members 
think he is the one that murdered and then just carried the bones with him everywhere he went. I mean, <laughs> it's like good luck explaining that away first off. Yeah. Because, you know, you're claiming you got it at a yard sale, but what the hell are the odds? Right. Like, that would be the craziest co- coincidence, like, ever. And he wasn't charged with anything. But that um, would be pretty young. Yeah. But if you think about it, it's like... It's not unheard of. Exactly. It's not unheard of, but 16 years old, it's a, your stepfather... Maybe he was so sick and tired of all of the fighting. And everybody says that the mom was, like, super batshit crazy. Interesting. Yeah. Because, like, it could have been, you know, it could be right where they don't think it's him that pulled the trigger. But Yeah, it could have been her. He was there when it happened. Yeah. And so then he's like, well, now I got to cover it up. Sure, I mean. Because now I'm in on it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, obviously, but. Yeah. It's interesting. So there you go. There's your two stories. Wow. What, what? Alrighty. <laughs> what did I say about giving me solved ones, you asshole? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, work on that. All right. Give me a couple do. weeks. Okay. <laughs> Fine. We'll get one eventually. I'm sure of it. <sighs> I need me one. Okay. 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 So make sure to like us on Facebook and all the other social media places. Uh, (laughs) give us a five-star review if you love us tell your friends tell your cats um bye. bye